The periodization Professor Kilson has selected for his lecture today ends in 1960. That, I think, is good. If his lecture extended beyond 1960 and embraced events taking place at Harvard, he would have to spend a great deal of time just talking about himself. <laughs> when I met Marty in 1960, he was involved in almost everything. His scholarship on Africa not only broke the colonial history mold, but his thought and action in respect to American democracy also broke the mold. His thought was center left. He made Harvard faculty and students on this side of the Charles think seriously about their responsibilities in African American and African studies as well as their participation in the civil rights movement. There was then no Department of African American Studies. There was then no Du Bois Institute. There, were, there was then few non-white students at Harvard. Fortunately, there was Marty Kilson. He stirred things up. He was a stimulant to both faculty and students, challenging them to think deeply and keenly about scholarship and critically and penetratingly about their actions. He was a significant participant in everything that represented Harvard's response to the new Negro. Marty was a role model and a mentor to the students. He held them to the highest standards and he engaged fully in their activities. His love was a tough love that the students did not always appreciate. But even when they rejected his suggestions, they endeavored to perform at a higher level. This was not only in the classroom, but also in their establishment of the first African-American and African academic and cultural organizations at Harvard. Marty and uh, Marion lived then in Cambridge, and both of them were sensitive to the whole life of the students and invited them into their homes. Marty's work among students was enhanced by the relationships he built with faculty and their respect for his scholarship. Consequently, when in the late 60s, the Rusofsky Committee was established to set forth Harvard's approach to African American studies, Marty was a member and his ideas were embodied in the conclusions. Out of the report and the deliberations around it came the notion of the Du Bois Institute. This was prior to the rebellion of students and the strike in 1969. Marty was active throughout the long period of student alienation and unrest. When the new president, Derek Bach, acted to put things in order, Marty was a rational voice influencing the shape of African-American studies. The politics of the time meant that Marty did not always win, but his imprint was on the final product, pointing the action in the direction of the highest academic standards and integrity. Marty worked with me and Daniel Aaron in bringing the New Boys Institute into being. He cooperated with the several interim directors and the first director, Nathan Huggins, to keep the Institute vital and on course. His voice was decisive in persuading Harvard to invite Skip Gates to come to the university. Skip's work has more than fulfilled Marty's vision and that of those who conceived the notion of the department and the Institute. I'm pleased, therefore, to introduce Marty because he has spent a half century 
producing a distinguished body of work that helps preserve the memory of African Americans and Africans because he has worked diligently to create and support institutions like the Department of African American Studies and the Du Bois Institute. Marty has been a constant supporter of the highest standards of scholarship and learning and an exemplary citizen of Harvard University. It's a privilege to celebrate his contributions by listening to his reflections upon black intelligentsia activism patterns, 1905 to 1960. Martin. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Williams. It was one of my oldest and dearest friends uh, here at Harvard University, as he knows it so well. And he's a very kind man, a very smart man, and he's a very modest man, as he knows. Or if he doesn't know, I'm telling him. There goes my cane. Uh, he has uh, played such a path-breaking and groundbreaking role in the status of <coughs> academic status of African American studies at Harvard himself, and in the status of the research side known as this great institution where we are now, the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute. He managed the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute before we had a formal full professor, director, responsible personality, who was, of course, the late professor Nathan uh, Huggins. Uh, and uh, that, I don't know whether that's in the historical records or not. It is. So how interesting. Um, so that's Professor Preston Williams. Thank you, Preston. Now, uh, let me try and get into these 20 odd pages on my second lecture topic, Black Intelligentsia Activism Patterns, uh, 1905 to 1960. I want to tell you about five different subtopics. One, background of the 20th century black leadership issues. Two, probing Booker T. Washington's accommodationism. Three, the Du Boisian foundation of civil rights activism. Four, the rise of black bourgeois activist personalities. Five, the Du Boisian legacy of black communitarian activism. And the last is a concluding note. Is black communitarian revival possible today? That's what I want to tell you about. <clears throat> In the second of my Du Bois lectures, the core topic I'll probe relates to how the evolving late 19th century and 20th century African American professional class went about performing its most central leadership task. That task was this. How do you challenge and eventually reverse the undemocratic, the unequalitarian, and the oppressive processes of America's white supremacist systems impact on black people? <clears throat> That's my topic. And the query I set myself as I spent six months putting these thoughts together for you. Fast upon First, the background to the 20th century black leadership issues. Fast upon the defeat of the secessionist southern states after the Civil War in 1865, the US federal government instituted a policy of political incorporation of the formerly enslaved Negro population into the American social and political order. That was the reconstruction policy. As W.E.B. Du Bois demonstrates in his great work, which I always, don't, always think isn't as well known as it should be compared, of course, to the souls of black folk, that great work is Black Reconstruction in America, 1860 to 1880. 
initially published in 1935 by Harcourt Brace, a reconstruction policy provided the formerly enslaved Negro a variety of experiences with democratic practices. And in the South Carolina state, where Negro voters were in the majority, the majority of the population, something I don't think many of us recognize, democratic practices under reconstruction policy were on the highest level as the United University of Chicago historian Thomas Holt, who by the way started his teaching career at Harvard as an instructor and assistant professor, as Thomas Holt demonstrates in his marvelous book, Black Over White, Negro Political Leadership in South Carolina During Reconstruction, published by University of Chicago Press in 1977. However, by early 1880s, with federal support of Reconstruction had ended, especially the withdrawal of the Union Army from Southern states as a protector of black people's democratic rights, and of course, especially their human rights, protection against just being slaughtered by terrorist white activity, what might be called a white supremacist, supremacist authoritarian deluge, or maybe even tsunami, destroyed black people's democratic and human rights. Authoritarian, violent, and terrorist Southern restorationist forces gained full hegemony <clears throat> owing to the federal government's unwillingness to sustain Reconstruction's voting rights, participatory rights, and basic human rights for black folks, the, the, the democratic participatory gains that black people chalked up under Reconstruction policy between 1867 and 1880 were smashed. Furthermore, although outside the South, where by 1910 nearly 10% of African Americans had now settled, a state-induced authoritarian pattern was not established against African Americans, yet nevertheless a broad range of what might be called white hegemonic maneuvers <coughs> that pre prevailed in the North. These white hegemonic maneuvers were both racist social system maneuvers and racist political system Maneuvers. This resulted, therefore, in multi-layered social structure and political development deficiencies in the nascent 20th century evolving African American society. As W.E.B. Du Bois, always at the forefront of analysis, by the way, as W.E.B. Du Bois was the first analyst to identify in his path-breaking book, The Philadelphia Negro, published in 1899 by the University of Pennsylvania Press. Accordingly, it can be said that the combination of authoritarian Southern restoration forces on the one hand and Northern white hegemonic maneuvers on the other hand resulted in development, social and political deficiencies in the character of the evolving 20th century black community and its professional class. One such deficiency was a five generation delay in the production of a full fledged African American modern political class, both in the South and the North. It was not, for example, until the passage of the major civil rights legislation and federal policy practices in the mid 1960s onward that typical African American citizen <coughs> gained full citizenship rights and full electoral participation rights. As the fledgling modern African-American social system entered the 20th century, just one and a half generations, basically 35 years after the Civil War, the nascent African-American professional class confronted a perplexing and monumental issue, namely, how do you fashion leadership processes for the formerly enslaved Negro Americans? I'll approach this monumental issue by hypothesizing two essential functions for modern ethnic group leadership in American society, two essential functions. One, generic leadership function can be characterized by the term 
that anthropologists often use, since my wife is an anthropologist, I know quite a lot about anthropology terms, namely the term social organization, very basic anthropological term, what might be called the social organization leadership function is concerned with fashioning the institutional infrastructure of modern ethnic group development. This means fashioning agencies like churches, mutual aid associations, artisans associations, farmers associations, <coughs> trade unions, fraternity, sorority associations, etc. Through these institutional infrastructure agencies, a modern ethnic group realizes what might be called civil society growth. A second <coughs> generic <coughs> leadership function for modern ethnic group development in a nation state society is to fashion status enhancing benefits and rights enhancing benefits for ethnic group citizens. Thus, the second generic leadership function for modern ethnic group development might be called, and I call it, mobilization type leadership function. Accordingly, it was through the experience of this mobilization type leadership function among post-reconstruction era black American society that the status enhancing and the rights enhancing goals of what became known as the civil rights movement and its political methodology emerged. It happened that for African Americans generally the betrayal of Reconstruction policy by the federal government from the 1880s onward placed a massive barrier to natural growth of what I call mobilization-type leadership processes. Within the South, where the vast majority of black people lived between 1900 and the 1940s, the mobilization-type leadership was brutally restricted by authoritarian racist practices by police practices, and of course, by vigilante terrorism. One crucial political mobilization consequence on the negative side of the mobilization ledger was therefore that by 1940, only 5% of voting age African American population in the South had been allowed to become registered voters, only 5%. Moreover, this particular political mobilization deficiency for the bulk of black American society and its, and its citizens during the first half of the 20th century operated to reinforce the massive overall modernizing deficiencies faced by black folks that stem from white supremacist social and economic system oppression throughout the South and I need hardly remind you that significant modernizing deficiencies were also faced by black folks in the North during the first half of the 20th century. Accordingly, a massive federal government intervention through law, through federal <coughs> bureaucracy power was required to alter the massive modernizing deficiencies faced by black folks during the first half of the 20th century. However, before such federal intervention was possible and available, the vast majority of black Americans in the South had to rely almost exclusively on the embryonic form, that embryonic form of modern ethnic group leadership that we call social organization ethnic group leadership only in the North during the first half of the 20th century were some aspects of what I call mobilization type leadership available. The major African American leadership personality associated with the social organization ethnic leadership pattern between 1880s and, the, and his death in 1915 was Booker T. Washington who was educated at Hampton Institute in Virginia and was founder and president of Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, the major African-American leadership personality associated with the mobilization type ethnic group leadership pattern was the Fisk University educated founder of African-American progressivism, William Edward Burghardt Du Bois. <clears throat> now, 
my second subtopic, probing uh, Bookerite, Booker T. Washington's accommodationism. Among the several historical contexts that produced the political character of the Du Boisian civil rights activism, leadership, policy, and practices, perhaps the most important context revolved around the black leadership persona of Booker Talifaro Washington. Talifaro was his middle name. The black leadership persona fashioned in the late 19th century by Booker T. Washington has been labeled by historians political accommodationism. Leadership, this was essentially what I call don't challenge American racism leadership. Now, if we could magically transport, maybe by pressing a vein in our right arm, <clears throat> transport ourselves back 115 years to 1895 to Atlanta, Georgia, we would have experienced literally an extraordinary event relating to African Americans. That event ultimately shaped the contours of political leadership dynamics for the emergent modern African American society from the late 1890s through the first half of the 20th century. The extraordinary event I refer to was the presence of Booker Talaferro Washington. I love his middle name. Booker Talaferro Washington as a keynote speaker in the Atlanta Industrial Exposition in 1895. He told an audience of white capitalists, the leading figures of an exploding American industrial economy, no less the leading figures that all they had to worry about in regard to a troublesome American working class was the white proletariat. As Washington was well aware, the white proletariat could bid for citizenship status and rights, that is, they were within the American social contract, and thus they could attempt to influence the evolving industrial American nation state public policy purposes. But what about the recently emancipated black Americans? At the time, <clears throat> Booker T. Washington's historic Atlanta Industrial Exposition address, the black working class was totally excluded from full citizen citizenship rights and thus, of course, from the American social contract. By the early 20th century, over half of black working class comprised an agrarian proletariat. It was a black peonage agrarian class, no less, that endured authoritarian domination within the mainly cotton and tobacco agriculture industry in the South. And this black peonage agrarian class produced most of the massive wealth, the massive wealth derived from Southern capitalist agriculture and from the 1880s on through World War II. The remainder of the black working class sector comprised millions of unskilled domestic laborers in middle class and elite white homes, both in the North and the South, and also comprised millions of unskilled black factory workers in the North. What Booker T. Washington <clears throat> told the capitalist elite at the 1895 Atlanta Industrial Exposition about the future status of the 90 odd percent majority of African Americans who were struggling poor or poor proletarians as America was leaving the late 19th century and entering the 20th century. What did Washington tell his listeners, his capitalist elite audience at Atlanta? He told them this, first, Washington belittled, he belittled the possibility just the possibility of applying democratic citizenship and political rights to advance the modern development of America's struggling black population. This, of course, cheered the capitalist elite at the Atlanta Industrial Exposition. Second, Washington addressed black Americans generally. He advised black folks, the brothers and sisters, let's say, 
to forget about citizenship and political rights. Leave them alone, he advised. Or let me use Washington's homespun language, start a dairy farm, start a truck farm, he advised the brothers and sisters. And in more florid, and he had marvelously florid the homespun language, Washington at the 1890 Atlanta Industrial Exposition raised his two hands, raised his two hands and proclaimed that in matters of political rights and citizenship rights, white folks and black folks will, and I quote, be as separate as the fingers on my hands. The great Booker T. Washington, and he was great, by the way, in his own leadership way. After all, he started a Negro college in the 1880s. He elaborated on this conservative accommodationism methodology for black people to adopt in his 1902 book, The Future of the Race, a marvelous book if you've never read it. Let me quote some of it. I believe that the past and the present teach but one lesson to the Negro's white friends, that means, of course, liberal friends in the North, and to the Negro himself. There is one lesson, namely, that there is but one hope of solution to the race problem, that it is for the Negro in every part of America to resolve that from henceforth that he will throw aside every non-essential, by that he means citizenship rights and human rights, every non-essential and cling only to essential, that is, the Negro's pillar of fire by night and his pillar of cloud by day shall be property, economy, education, and Christian character. Two of us, to us, Negroes, that is, to us, just now, these are the wheat, all else is chaff. My third topic, the Du Boisian Foundation of Civil Rights Activism. Now, it was the search for a response to this Bookerite Black Accommodationism Leadership Methodology that Du Bois and his allies <clears throat> among the emergent black intelligentsia fashioned an activism black leadership methodology. Whereas accommodationism was a form of what I earlier characterized as social organization leadership function, the Du Bois and Civil Rights Activism Leadership Methodology was a form of what I characterized as mobilization type, mobilization type leadership function, which was the leadership function concerned, concerned with two crucial things, enhancing benefits and enhancing rights, enhancing benefits for black people oppressed by America's racist oligarchy. Du Bois's initial circle of allies included just a small group of people, but incredibly talented African-American intelligentsia personalities, Monroe Trotter, a journalist, Archibald Rimke, a lawyer, Reverend e. Ransom, an African and Methodist Episcopal clergyman who will later become a bishop, R.R. R. Wright, a sociologist, and also an African Methodist Episcopal clergy who will also become a bishop later on in the 1930s, Anna Julia Cooper, a civic activist and educationist among African Americans, among others. Insofar as Du Bois was the most precocious, always the most precocious and the most intellectually assertive formulator in this circle of early 20th century black intelligentsia allies, it was Du Bois who first formulated in print the ideological and the political precepts underlying the mobilization type leadership methodology. This Du Bois did initially in, this, <clears throat> in what I view as that quintessential text of African American progressivism, namely The Souls of Black Folk, published in 1903 by a little independent printer in Chicago called A.C. McClear. I have a first edition of it, I, which I just cherish. 
writing in chapter 3 titled of Mr. Washington, that's Mr. Booker T. Washington, and others, Du Bois refers to his circle of black intelligentsia allies as the other class of Negroes who cannot agree with Mr. Booker T. Washington. He's always polite when referring, indeed deferential, to Booker T. Washington, and it's always Mr. Booker T. Washington. He then proceeds to boldly formulate a modernization type black leadership methodology, as I call it, that challenges the Bookerite accommodationism methodology, while first magnanimously expressing that his activist circle of men in black leadership honor Booker T. Washington for his attitude of conciliation toward the white South. Du Bois then identifies the indispensable principles of a progressive black leadership nexus with the poor Negro masses. That nexus, Du Bois believed, is premised on first, fidelity with black people's honor, hmm? fidelity with black people's honor. Accordingly, Du Bois wrote that he and his activist circle, and I quote, insist that the way to truth and right lies in straightforward honesty, not in indiscriminate flattery of white people. It lies in remembering that only a firm adherence to their higher ideals and aspirations will keep those ideals within the realm of political possibility. Du Bois then elaborates this anti-Washingtonian perspective as follows. Listen, they, that is Du Bois's activist circle, are absolutely certain that the way for a people to gain their reasonable rights is not by voluntarily throwing them away and insisting that they do not want them, that the way for a people to gain respect is not by continually belittling and ridiculing themselves, that on the contrary, Negroes must insist continually, in season, out of season, that voting is necessary for modern manhood, that color discrimination is barbarian, and that black boys need education as well as white boys. That's at pages 54, 55 of the first edition of the Souls of Black Folks. Thus, for the young Du Bois in 1903, these core ideological ingredients of a progressive black leadership nexus with the African American masses amounted to what I call a moral imperative, a moral imperative. As such, they define what might be called the obligation and responsibility contours of the evolving 20th century African American society and its professional class, its intelligentsia. In operational terms, therefore, Du Bois was saying in 1903 that the ingredients of a progressive black leadership methodology must be the diametric opposite of black, of Bookerite accommodationism. As Du Bois put this in chapter three of The Souls of Black Folk, and I quote to you, by failing to state plainly and unequivocally the legitimate demands of their people, the thinking classes of American Negroes would shirk a heavy responsibility, a responsibility to themselves, a responsibility to the whole darker races of mankind whose future depends so largely on this American Negro experiment. That's at page 55. Accordingly, as Du Bois is about to close out his chapter three titled of Mr. Booker Washington and others, he proclaims that his activist leadership circle could never accept Washington's accommodationism proposition of reconciliation with the American racist oligarchy. After all, says Du Bois, such a reconciliation required black people to put a hold indefinitely, a hold indefinitely on the acquisition of full citizenship rights 
on the acquisition of political participatory rights, and on, of course, the acquisition of human rights. This is how Du Bois formulated this crucial aspect of the black mobilization le leadership type in 1903. If that Bookerite reconciliation, if that Bookerite reconciliation is to be marked by the industrial slavery and the civic death of black men when, <clears throat> with permanent legislation into a position of inferiority, then those black men, if they are really men, are called upon every single, <clears throat> are called upon by every consideration of patriotism and loyalty to oppose such a course by all civilized means, even though such opposition involves as well disagreement with Mr. Booker T. Washington, we have no right to sit silently by with the when the in inevitable seeds are sown for a harvest of disaster to our children. That's at pages 55 and 56. Now, I might point out here that Professor Cornell West in his seminal essays, Democracy Matters 2004, refers to Du Bois's 1903 formulation of what I call the progressive black leadership methodology as an event that defines Du Bois as an Emersonian democratic intellectual. Here's how Cornell West puts this matter of the Emersonian democratic intellectual aspect of the young W.E.B. Du Bois. For Emerson, says West, to be a democratic intellectual is to speak out on uncomf uncomfortable, uncomfortable truths. To be an active player in public discourse is to be thrown into life's contingency and fragility with the heavy baggage of history and tradition, baggage like the American legacy of race. Thus, when Du Bois challenges the Book Bookerite accommodationist leadership methodology, by delineating the principles of a progressive black leadership perspective, Professor Cornell West is saying that Du Bois was, and I quote, lifting the veil over the invisibility of black individuals, over the in in invisibility of black community, and over the invisibility of black society who were denied by white supremacist America. Now, of course, when writing The Souls of Black Folk, the young Du Bois did not know that by functioning as what Cornel West calls an Emersonian democratic intellectual, he was also preparing <clears throat> the road to Niagara in 1905. As it happened, it was at that historic gathering of about 25 progressive black intelligentsia personalities on the Canadian side of the Niagara River, since no one would house them on the American side some 110 years ago, it was at Niagara where the principles of what I call Du Boisian progressivism were first formalized. Those principles were drafted by W.E.B. Du Bois himself for the Niagara Conference resolutions. Let me read some of them. We will not be satisfied to take one jot or tittle less than, over, than our full manhood rights. We claim for ourselves every single right that belongs to a freeborn American, political rights, civil rights, and social rights. And until we get these rights, we will never cease to protest and assail the ears of American society, the battle we, we wage is not for ourselves alone, but for all, all true Americans. It is a fight for ideals. Among those specific goals sought by those attending the 1905 Niagara Movement Conference were the following. First, we would vote 
with the right to vote goes everything. Second, we want discrimination in public accommodation to cease. Third, we claim that the right of free men to walk, to talk, and be with them <coughs> that wish to be with us. Fourth, we want our children educated. Fifth, we want the laws enforced against rich as well as poor, <coughs> capitalists as well as laborer, against white as well as black. These then, five of them, these then are some of the chief things we want. How shall we get them? By voting where we may vote, by persistent and unceasing agitation, by hammering at the truth, by sacrifice and work. Now, when looking back across a century of several, several black intelligentsia activist strands in American society, it is useful to have a classificatory schema for differentiating among these strands. I would hypothesize, therefore, a threefold classificatory schema. The first can be labeled political mobilization activist strand, political mobilization activist strand. The second can be labeled black consciousness activist strand, and the third can be labeled black bourgeois activist strand. Accordingly, on the basis of my discussion of the 1905 Niagara Movement Conference, the Niagara professionals can be classified as part of the political mobilization activist strand. The 1930s New Negro Movement Intelligentsia, whom I probed in my first lecture yesterday, represented Africa America's black consciousness activist strand. And I want to discuss now for you briefly the attributes of the third activist strand that evolved among American, African American intelligentsia during the 20th century. That third activist strand, as I said, can be dubbed the, the black bourgeois activist strand. Perhaps the core attribute of intelligentsia personalities I classify as black bourgeois activists is that they are politically paradoxical, which is to say that although black bourgeois activists express some commitment to advancing political rights for black folks on the one hand, they also cling ideologically to bourgeois ideals and societal patterns on the other hand. Ergo, they're paradoxical. For example, they remain capitalist friendly in their politics, opposing progressive public policies that regulate and discipline business and the overall American capitalist order. <clears throat> they basically oppose public policies that advance the needs of the wider American society vis-a-vis -vis the overall capitalist American process. Thus, when such black bourgeois activist personalities connected with, connect with the Du Boisian black leadership mobilization type activism during the first half of the 20th century, they usually did so along one dimensional, one dimensional lines, not along multi broad dimensional lines. So this is why I use the term black bourgeois activist to describe that activist strand among the evolving 20th century black professional class. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> of, the, of the early, I have to start skipping, now of the early 20th century black activist personalities who tilted occasionally in favor of Du Boisian civil rights activism, I want to comment briefly on several of them. One early 20th century brilliant and courageous black bourgeois activist personality was Ida Wells Barnett, a second <coughs> reluctant but noble bourgeois activist personality was Madam C.J. Walker, a third early 20th century black activist personality 
to mention is the business lawyer in my city, what I call my city, Philadelphia, Raymond Pace Alexander, and a fourth was the black Presbyterian clergyman, Reverend Francis Grimke, who pastored a leading black Presbyterian church in Washington, D.C., and there were several others. Now I will skip. No use to telling you about all of them. Let me tell you about the second one whom I worked out here. That's Madam C.J. Walker, a marvelous figure. The second prominent early 20th century black bourgeois activist personality worth attention here was Madam C.J. Walker, who was an early millionaire African-American entrepreneur in the cosmetic industry and a board member of Booker T. Washington's Negro National Negro Business League. In August 1918, Madam C.J. Walker hosted the National Negro Business League's annual, annual convention at her Hudson River estate in New York. She delivered a welcoming address at that gathering in 1918 in which she lambasted, lambasted white vigilante attacks occurring against Negro soldiers in towns that bordered U.S. Army bases during World War I. In the days not long after Madam Walker's address, she received a sharp criticism from powerful white members of the Board of Trustees of Tuskegee Institute, where the National Negro Business League was housed and located. It was the late Booker T. Washington secretary and confidant, Emmett Scott, who attended the League's 1918 convention and who was informed and who informed Tuskegee Institute's board members about Madam Walker's address, characterizing the address as incendiary. It was a letter of criticism from a white board member of Tuskegee Institute named Colonel William J. J. A. Y. Scheffling that especially annoyed Madam C.J. Walker. One might say it violated her sense of black people's honor. In a first-rate biography of Madam C.J. Walker by her granddaughter, Alelia Bundles, a graduate of Harvard College, by the way, we learn that in January 1919, a letter <coughs> about a letter in January 1919 that Madam J. Walker sent to Colonel Scheifling, in which she stands her ground and defended the need for professional class African Americans like herself to critique Booker T. Washington accommodationism when the human rights and the civil rights of black people are violated. Here are some of Madam Walker's words. <clears throat> Her black bourgeois progressive epiphany, let's call them. The Negro in the South had been denied the use of firearms and has been no match for the fiends, this is her language, for the fiends and the brutes who have taken advantage of his helplessness, having bravely, fiercely bled and died on the battlefields of Europe, they, they black soldiers, will soon be returning, returning to what? Does any reasonable person imagine to the old order of things? to submit to being strung up, riddled with bullets, burned at the stake? No, a thousand times, no. They will come back to face life like men, whatever is in store for them, and like men, defend themselves, their families, their homes. Please, Colonel Shaffling, Understand that this does not mean that I wish to encourage in any way a conflict between the races. <clears throat> she says, please understand, Colonel Scheffling, that this does not mean that I wish to encourage in any way a conflict between the races. Such a thing 
is farther is from my mind. My message to my people is this. Go, live, conduct yourself so that you will be above the reproach of anyone. But should one prejudice, prejudice this is Madam C.J. Walker's words, but should one prejudice, irrational boast, infringe upon your rights as men, resent the insults like men, and if death be the result, so be it. An honorable death is far better than the miserable existence imposed upon most of our people in the South, Colonel Shefling. I have tried very hard to make you see the thing through the eyes of a Negro, which I realize now is next to impossible. Your talks about my speech would do a far greater good if you would point out to the white folks just what their duties to Negroes are. That's Madam C.J. Walker. Besides the journalist Ida Wells Barnett and the millionaire cosmetic entrepreneur Madam Walker, as I've just said, other black boys were activist personalities during the period between the two world wars included business lawyer Raymond Pace Alexander. Uh, they all, it also, this list also included of black bourgeois activists, also included an incredible personality who was the owner of the North Carolina Mutual Insurance Company. That's, of course, the great Charles Clifton Spalding. He was the wealthiest black person in the state of North Carolina during the years between the two world wars and certainly one of the top three or four wealthiest persons and black persons in all of the United States. But after being publicly insulted by a white store clerk in Durham's largest department store, he tried and was refused to try on, he tried to uh, try on a suit. Charles Balding had a kind of epiphany and fashioned it for himself thereafter an activist perspective towards American racism. So in the early 1930s, he contacted the civil rights activist editor of Durham's black newspaper, a weekly, agreeing to assist its finance henceforth. And in 1940, he linked up with Black Durham's main activist civic, Black Civic Association, also agreeing to support its finances henceforth. This is what I mean by black bourgeois activism. This, mind you, was a radical event for a bourgeois gentleman like Charles Clifton Spaulding, because, because like C, Madam C.J. Walker before him, Spaulding started his business career as a devotee of Booker T. Washington's accommodationism and of course, especially a devotee of its National Negro Business League. The career of the great black capitalist Charles Spaulding as a black bourgeois activist personality is probed by the University of North Carolina historian Walter Weir, W-E-A-R-E, -E, in a brilliant chapter published in John Hope Franklin's 1982 brilliant and path-breaking book, 20th Century Black Leadership. The last example of a black bourgeois activist personality I want to mention briefly is the black Presbyterian clergyman, Reverend Francis Grimke, a graduate of a black college in the 1880s, Lincoln University, my own alma mater, and of Princeton University Theology School, Reverend Grimke celebrated Booker T. Washington's role in the early phase of his life in organizing and advancing Tuskegee Institute. But it was Booker T. Washington's dramatic failure to publicly condemn the vicious anti-Negro Atlanta riot in 1906, and it was really vicious, and the equally vicious Springfield, Illinois riot of 1908, and it was really vicious, that cooled Reverend Francis Grimke toward Booker T. Washington's leadership. Accordingly, 
in an, in an obituary commentary on Washington's leadership for one of the black newspapers in Washington, D.C., Reverend Francis Grimke observed as follows. His, that is Booker T. Washington's, attitude on the rights of the Negro was anything but satisfactory. He either dodged the issue when he came face to face with it, or he dealt with it in such a way as not to offend those who were not in favor of courting the Negro full citizenship rights. He never squarely faced the issue and in a straightforward, manly spirit declared his belief in the Negro as a man and citizen and as entitled to the same treatment as any other man and citizen. His death will be a loss to Tuskegee, but will not be a loss to the Negro race. The race will not in any way suffer from his death. It will not suffer in its higher aspiration, nor in its efforts in behalf of its rights, as it did in the death of Frederick Douglass. In neither of these respects, did Mr. Washington make himself felt? That's from the works of William Francis Grimke, works of Grimke, volume three, published in 1942 by the Associated Press and edited by the owner of the Associated Press, who was the historian Carter G. Woodson. My next topic, which I'll try and be brief for you, the Du Boisian activist legacy and black communitarianism. Now, what was the legacy of the Du Boisian activist leadership pattern? The first thing to point out is that the legacy of the Du Boisian activism leadership pattern was multidimensional, so to speak. Which is to say, the Du Boisian activism legacy from the Niagara Movement 1905 to the end of World War II was more than the politically institutionalized expressions associated with the national level machinery of the NAACP, which Du Bois helped to organize in 1909. The Du Boisian activism leadership legacy was above all what I call black communitarian activism. Although it is not adequately recognized, I think, among analysts of W.E.B. Du Bois's leadership approach, Du Bois actually entertained a kind of two-tier black leadership orientation, so to speak. On the top tier, Du Bois articulated his NAACP-connected civil rights desegregation or integration black leadership orientation, which he presented at NAACP official gatherings and through the pages of the NAACP journal, The Crisis, which he edited until 1934. In regard to the second tier, Du Bois Black Leadership Orientation, Du Bois propagated, as I said, a black communitarian and activism leadership orientation. He did both simultaneously. The second tier leadership orientation held that black society and black civil society, especially, and its agencies, generally churches, civic associations, mutual aid groups, women organizations, etc., had a special obligation and responsibility to outreach, to outreach to black working class masses. Du Bois first expressed the ingredients of a black communitarian activism, I believe, way back, way back in 1903 in that quintessential text of African-American progressivism, The Souls of Black Folk. Of course, he expressed the ingredi these ingredients not in the social science language that I use, that is, not as black communitarian activism. Rather, Du Bois to use that marvelous, marvelously haunting and even lyrical English prose he first experimented with when writing the souls of black folk. Let me read a, a brief passage from Souls, which reveals, I think, unmistakably the young Du Bois's commitment to what I call black communitarian 
activism. This passage is from chapter four, titled Of the Meaning of Progress. Read it if you have never read it. Once upon a time, I taught school in the hills of Tennessee, where the broad, dark veil, V-A-L-E, of the Mississippi begins to roll and crumble to greet the Alleghenies. I was a Fisk University student then, and all Fisk men thought that Tennessee, beyond the veil, V-E-I-L, huh? Two veils. Beyond the veil was theirs alone. And in vacation time, they sallied forth in lusty bands to meet the county school commissioners, who, of course, were white. Young and happy, I too went. Huh? I too went. And I shall not soon forget that summer 17 years ago. So he's writing in 1903, so that's 1886 and 1887. First, there was a teacher's institute at the county seat where distinguished guests of the superintendent, that means, of course, white folks, taught teachers fractions and spelling. White teachers in the morning, Negroes at night. Huh? There came a day when all the teachers left the institute and began to hunt for schools. I secured a school. The schoolhouse was a log hut where Colonel Wheeler, who owned all the land once, used to shelter his corn. I, huh, a school hut where Colonel Wheeler used to shelter a corn crib, they called it when I was a boy. It sat in a lot behind a rail fence and thorn bushes near the sweetest of springs. The lyrical Du Bois near the sweetest of springs. There was an entrance where a door once was and a massive rickety fireplace. Furniture was scarce. Pale black board crouched in the corner. My desk was made of three boards, and my chair, borrowed from the landlady, had to be returned every night. Seats for the children were rough plank benches without backs. It was a hot morning in July when the school opened. I trembled. <laughs> he trembled when I heard the patter of little black feet down the dusty road and saw the growing row of dark, solemn faces, bright, eager eyes facing me. There they sat, nearly 30 of them on rough benches, their faces shading from a pale cream to a deep brown, the little feet, little feet bare and swinging, the eyes full of expectation, full of expectation, with here and there a little twinkle of mischief, the lyrical Du Bois, and the hands grasping Webster's blue, black, blue back spelling book. I loved my school, and the fine faith of those children had in the wisdom of their teacher was truly marvelous. For two summers, two summers, I lived in this little world. That's all taken from page 60 to 67. I just uh, snitched and snatched pieces of it. Now it is clear that what I just read from Young Du Bois's hand and published in Souls 1903 was about black communitarian activism and that leadership mindset. Or to be more precise, it was about one of the early cultural and societal ingredients of black communitarian activism that was in 1886 and 1887, literally swirling around the mind of that young Fisk University student named William Edward Burghardt Du Bois. Later in a series of articles in the crisis during 1933 and 1934 for two years, W.E.B. Du Bois elaborated what I'm calling his black communitarian leadership orientation. In a January 1934 issue of the crisis, Du Bois discussed the need for what he called the race-conscious black cooperating together 
in his own institutions and movements so as to organize, I'm still quoting, and conduct enterprises. He went on to say that a black communitarian activism movement for black people was nothing new or radical. Why? Because, said Du Bois in 1934, and I quote, the vast majority of Negroes in the United States are born in colored homes, educated in separate colored schools, attend separate colored churches, and find their amusements in colored YMCA's and YWCA's. A lot of you, I'm too, I'm, I'll be almost 80, I'm pushing 80. 79, in eight months I'll be 80. So I know this world, I grew up in this world. Uh, and, and when I read this stuff, it just brings back so a whole a universe of existence. Is that the way to put it? Now it happens that Du Bois, huh, it's marvelous. Let me read it to you again. Why? <laughs> the vast majority of Negroes in the United States are born in colored homes, educated in colored schools, attend separate colored churches, and find their happiness their amusement in colored YMCA's and YWCA's. I end this by telling you about a YMCA tale of my youth. Now it happens that Du Bois used the everyday milieu of what might be called the nooks and crannies of black civil society agencies like churches, civic associations, women organizations, and the like, and of course the campuses of Negro colleges to propagate the black communitarian outlook that was running around his head. I first encountered W.E.B. Du Bois at the Mary Dodd Memorial Presbyterian Chapel at Lincoln University. In the fall term of 1949, my freshman semester, the president of Lincoln University, Horace Mann Bond, who was the father of Julian Bond, invited Du Bois to address the Sunday service and one of Du Bois's topics related to what I call the Black Communitarian Activism Leadership Orientation and the New York University historian David Lewis's seminal biography of Du Bois, his volume titled W.E.B. Du Bois, The Fight for Equality and the American Century, 1919 to 1963, can be found several accounts of Du Bois's numerous trips, numerous trips around the country in the 20s and the 30s in order to speak at different black civil society agencies and especially at black Negro, a Negro college, we call them Negro college campuses. In those speeches, Du Bois discussed what I'm talking about here, black communitarian issues. I now turn to two examples of black communitarian activism. I'll just mention them briefly between the 1920s and the 1950s to give you more substance of this notion that I believe is fundamental to the Du Boisian leadership legacy. From the 1920s until the 1950s, many black civil society agencies fashioned the forms of what I call outreach to black masses activism. I want to discuss just several of these examples. These black civil society agencies were operated by middle class and professional class African Americans who intermeshed their social class identity on the one hand with black ethnic commitment or orientation. On the other hand, this meant that these black middle class and professional personalities were connected with black churches, connected with black civic associations, connected with black fraternal or sorority organizations, and connected with black professional associations among lawyers, doctors, dentists, nurses, accountants, business persons, public school administrators, and of course, Negro college academics. A case study article that showed how vibrant uh, this black communitarian activism pattern was between the 1930s and the 1950s was published by the Vanderbilt University historian Dennis Dickerson in the AME Church Review, April, June 2004 issue titled Medicine for the Masses, the Health Commission of Negro Elks, 1927 to 1952. 
Professor Dickerson's article is a very important article on this black communitarianism phenomenon. Professor Dickerson's article describes the medical clinic program of 100,000 member Negro Elks organization between the two world wars. He discovered that there were nearly 700 Negro Elk branches in some 400 black communities and each branch supported a medical clinic program. To my knowledge, not, nothing like this black elk's outreach to black masses, communitarian activism exists here today. Another study of the activities of black middle class civic associations, fraternal author, sorority organizations and the like in Philadelphia between the 1930s into the 1960s also reports a vibrant outreach to black masses activism by black civil society agencies. This Philadelphia study was by the University of California historian. He moves around a lot in the last five years. He's now at the University of, of California. I recently discovered at Riverside, that's Vincent Franklin, the several historians whom I recognize in the audience know who he is, which was reported in his 1979 book, which I think, in fact, was his PhD thesis, maybe at the Harvard School of Education, reported in his 1979 book titled Education of Black Philadelphia, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press. The title is a complete mis mis misnomer, is that the term? Professor Franklin reports the following. The Deltas brought speakers to the city for free lectures and sponsored an annual education week, similar to that of the Negro Elks, who also sponsored an annual education week in cities. The annual go to high school, go to college campaign of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity was supported by organization, by the organization's national and local membership. The campaign in Philadelphia usually consisted of a week of activities for children and their parents stressing the educational benefits of secondary and higher education. Such prominent persons as A. Philip Randolph, the trade union leader, Carter G. Woodson, the historian, Raymond Pace Alexander, the civil rights and business lawyer, W.E.B. Du Bois himself spoke during these educational campaigns. This sampling, and I'm still quoting from Professor Vincent Franklin, this sampling of activities and organizations indicates that commitment of these civic and fraternal groups to informing black youth about the need to improve themselves through higher education was broadcast. There's more, but I have to skip. Okay, concluding note, is black communitarian revival possible today? Now I want to make just some concluding reflections on this query from our vantage point here in the early 20, 21st century in regard to the contemporary condition of black communitarian activism as a component of the Du Boisian leadership legacy. My belief is that today the condition of black communitarian component of that Du Boisian leadership legacy is quite weak, if maybe almost non-existent. No doubt the reasons for this situation are numerous and quite clearly one of the basic reasons has been black middle class flight from inner city black communities that commenced in the 19, late 1970s and became a steady state development by the mid 1980s. Of course, the black middle class flight from inner city communities occurred in the context of a variety of what I would call precipitating urban decline dynamics. The first of these were, of course, capitalist flight from urban areas and thus the deindustrialization of America's cities. Second, the systemic changes contributed to the steady state joblessness crisis facing black urban working class in particular by the mid 1960s onward. Third, joblessness in turn fueled 
the extensive black urban riots from the mid-1960s into the 1970s, and sad to say that joblessness crisis persists here in the early 21st century at monstrous levels, at monstrous levels, causing a situation wherein today some 35% of African-American children live in poverty. Returning to the period late 60s into the 70s, that period's black proletarians, I'm skipping, that period's black proletarians against the system riots, as I like to call them, black proletarians against the system riots petered out by 1977 and 1978. So from 1980 onward, black proletarians against the system riots were being replaced by what might be called black lower class internal mayhem which is sometimes called black-on-black -black violence and crime. This aspect of black urban neighborhood decline was intensified by what I view as the neo-racist so-called war on drugs that became a national federal policy under the early smiling face Reagan administration starting in 1982 to 1983 instead of a war on drugs by the way, by, 19, by 2008, resulted in nearly a million working class black males in jail. Nearly a million huh, black males in jail. There should have been a federal policy level called drug rehabilitation program. So the neo-racist war on drugs intensified and exaggerated, exaggerated the neighborhood decline aspects of black on black violence and crime as the African-American public policy analyst Michelle Alexander vividly relates in her recent book published in 2010 called uh, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Color Blindness, published by New Press. I owe it to my son who might be here who gave me the book recently as a birthday gift. Accordingly, when by late 1980s, black middle class flight plus the Reagan administration's war on drugs, it's a war on black folks, huh? War on drugs uh, coexisted in urban black communities. The conditions for black, for the broad decline in urban black, black neighborhoods were extensive this then was the situation facing urban communities widely in the late 1980s and throughout the 1990s. Therefore, by the end of the 90s, black communitarian activism as a contributor to the social advancement of the weak black working class and poor sector was very weak indeed. Now, a tale of my experience with black communitarian decline it's a tale of my experience with a period of viable black communitarian dynamics on the one hand, and on the other hand, my face-to-face -face experience with a black urban neighborhood's decline, decay, associated with black middle-class flight in the 1980s onward. My personal tale relates to what I told you earlier about Professor Vincent Franklin's research on viable Du Boisian communitarian activism patterns that prevailed in Philadelphia from the 1920s through the 1950s. That period was one when many neighborhoods in Philadelphia's black communities were sociologically stable, comprised of a small but communitarian oriented black middle class sector and a large but stable black working class sector. My personal tale focuses on such a sociologically mixed and stable black urban Philadelphia neighborhood from the 1930s into the 1950s when I was growing up, which of course is over 75 years ago, in a small black community in a Pennsylvania mill town about 35 miles outside Philadelphia County. The overall black community in Philadelphia was served by three, three black run YMCA's. One black run YMCA was the Pulaski Street YMCA located in a subsection 
of Philadelphia, sort of on its north, on its north, northwest edge, called Germantown. Well, that's what it was called. It was known as, as Germantown. That YMCA was aided in its operation by a black church located in the stable working class and middle class neighborhoods surrounding the Pulaski Street YMCA. Its director was a kind of courtly mannered black gentleman. Henry Gates know these kinds of black folks. Hello, would you? A courtly mannered, very courtly mannered uh, black gentleman. They were kind of black royalists in a certain sense. Its director was a courtly mannered black gentleman. William Coleman Sr. was his name, who, was also op who also operated a camp for black youth, males, called Camp Emlyn, located about 80 miles north of Philadelphia County in a rural, rural town, mainly Mennonite, actually, in the lower foothills of the Pocono Mountains. I and my younger brother Richard attended Camp Emlyn for two weeks during two summers, and we were required to attend activities. That's how I discovered Pulaski Street YMCA. We were required to attend activities at Pulaski Street YMCA in Germantown section of Northwest Philadelphia several times a year. We did this by riding an old rickety bus that traveled along a route called Route 309, sometimes called the Bethlehem Pike because it ultimately ended way up 120 miles north in that great steel town called Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. We did this by riding an old rickety bus that traveled between Germantown and small towns on the edge of Philadelphia County. The stable working class and middle class black neighborhood where the Pulaski Street YMCA was located was a vibrant and safe, safe urban African American neighborhood. That's what I call, that's what I recall about the Pulaski Street YMCA in Germantown during the 1939 through 1943 period. Now, fast forward 40 odd years later when I was teaching here at Harvard University and went to visit. I had a kind of feeling. I wonder what's happening to that old place I loved. I went to visit that old Negro Pulaski Street YMCA. I was shocked by what I saw. Perhaps devastated may be the best word. Many houses in the neighborhood were run down. Some houses were all boarded up. And that marvelous brick building that housed the Pulaski Street YMCA was run down and shuttered the whole bloody place. I said, what the good Lord has happened here? As I said, I was devastated at what I saw. I asked around to find out more about what the neighborhood decaying process was for that once lovely Pulaski Street Negro YMCA. I was told that commencing in the late 1970s, there was first a slow pattern, a slow pattern of middle class flight to old black communities in the mill towns surrounding Philadelphia County, towns like Chester, PA, that's to the southeast, Reading, PA, that's to the northwest, <clears throat> Norristown, that's almost to the due west, PA, which is the county seat of my county, Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, and even they came to my factory hometown called Amber, PA. By the mid-1980s, middle-class flight from Pulaski Street YMCA neighborhood was almost total, and the remaining black working-class families were mainly weak and poor working-class, not stable black working-class families. Accordingly, the ingredients of urban black neighborhood decay had set in around the Pulaski Street YMCA like a tumor. As of 2000, when I last visited that Philadelphia black neighborhood, the decaying process was still apparent. Above all, there were no longer black communitarian activism agencies of systemic significance in the Pulaski Street black neighborhood surrounding the old Negro Pulaski Street Y. A concluding thought. However, 
In the second decade now, here we are of the 21st century, I still believe that African-American middle-class and professional class can help facilitate what I call the revival of black communitarian activism in urban black communities. We might think of this new black communitarian activism in terms of a black society, a black civil society revitalization movement, a black civil society revitalization movement, the core reason for a black civil society revitalization movement is, I think, plain uh, enough, because during the post-civil rights movement era from the late eight, 1970s onward, we have witnessed the emergence of a two-tier, two-tier African-American class system, let's call it. This is a black America in which many of its citizens have life chances being strangled by an array of social crises. Conceptually, we can label one tier of today's African-American society the black mobile stratum, and we can label the second tier the black static stratum. The middle class and professional families make up the black mobile stratum, while black weak working class and sub-poor families make up the black static stratum. What I label the static stratum is that sector of African-American families that has been pushed aside by a combination of the American greed-riddled national economy on the one hand and by dysfunctional public education systems on the other hand. I believe that it must be stated firmly by black leadership that the national economy and federal public policy processes have a major obligation to assist remedying the social crises that injure weak working class and poor African American families. But I also believe that there is an important contribution for the black American middle class and professional sector for people like me, my children, my grandchildren to make towards remedying the social crises facing the weak working class and poor and sub-poor African-American families. Here in the second decade of the 21st century, I suggest that a black civil society revitalization movement is one way, at least, for the black mobile stratum for people like me and my clan to use its new resources to contribute toward remedy, remedying the social crises that injure the life chances of static stratum, the black static static stratum sector. This could be a serious way for today's 21st century African-American intelligentsia, our professional class to fulfill a debt to the intellectual and leadership legacy of William Edward Burghardt Du Bois. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Marty. You can tell by the <clears throat> the uh, length and depth, as it were, of the applause how much we value your um, second lecture, just as we valued your first. That I could Thank listen you, to you, Thank you. Um, all evening. Um, <clears throat> but I wanted to ask you. I was thinking about your time machine analogy when you said you know you could touch a vein and right if we go went back, back to 1895. It'd be September in Atlanta, and there'd be old Booker T. Right. And then I, I think about China and um, mm -hmm. Singapore and think about other places that have to decide um, if you want to prioritize political rights over economic rights mm -hmm. and, and not defending what's happening in China or Singapore. But I'm just wondering, was there ever a prayer for Washington, if we presume good faith? Because everybody de demonizes them and just say, right. you handkerchief head Uncle Tom. Right. But presume good faith right. for a second, it just is an intellectual exercise. Was there ever a prayer that his ostensible <laughs> vision could have, could have worked? You know, sooner or later, democracy will come to Cuba, democracy will come to China. 
Wait, well, forget Cuba right now. Just think of China. When as the middle class gets bigger, because there's no middle class in, in Cuba yet, but it, there is in China, and sooner or later, inevitably, sooner or later, they will demand, you know, one person, one vote, et cetera, et cetera. I just wonder if it was possible for it to have happened in the United States, or <clears throat> if because of the history of the United States and political rights and the way we valorize the, 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 the rule of law, et cetera, if, in fact, it had to be the way Du Bois said it had to be. And I mean that just totally innocently without an agenda. Well, no, oh, well, that's all hypothetical thinking. Mm. You know, I have a former student who's here. He can speak for his bloody self. Uh, as you know, I love him, but he and I have differed all these years. He's in the class of uh, 72, probably 73, 74. He's made millions. Uh, anyway, I don't want to embarrass him, <laughs> him but he and I talk about this all the time. Uh, no, it's just one of those hypothetical. You mean his initials are Lewis Jones? Uh, anyway. <laughs> no, I don't want to name it. It's just one of those hypothetical you know, discourse things. It just uh, will always remain hypothetical. No, I mean, if Booker T. Washington's accommodationism had prevailed, none of us would be here. None of us would be here. Because to be here, something had to challenge America's racist oligarchy. You know, that we would get here at some point in time. That's what he's saying. Why should we have to wait until some point in time? What? That's all the voice, you know, and... Uh, that's all Du Bois and, you know, and Fanny, you know, Coppin and, and Anna Julia Cooper, you know, and then the next cohort of the progressive women, which I've been long interested in. I bought one of the case studies of one to show you. Where are those books I bought? <laughs> My wife bought them for me. I thought I'd pass them around. Uh, uh, it's, all, it's all hypothetical, Henry. So why? So you have to be conservative to, to, as Henry knows, you have, to be, you have to be conservative to turn to hypothetical discourse. We're talking about empirical. <laughs> Here's a great lady. Uh, we have to, we, we have, here's an incredible book. No people know it. It's published by one of these newcomer publishers. It has all the historical photographs for the different chapters of the great tome of American progressivism, black American progressivism, which is what, uh, of course, the souls of black folk is. It's an incredible book. My wife found it in one of these borders stores, and uh, it's just incredible. This is another example of the black professional class, where you write your own achievement history. It says there aren't many black scholars to write it, and very few white scholars to write it, so you write it. And the brothers go to a printer, and it's printed. This happens to be a graduate of my alma mater, maybe the class of 1926, and uh, someone sent it to me because they know I correct this stuff. No, Henry's query is a very interesting query, but it's just a lot of, you know, hypothetical ifs. Fluff. Well, <laughs> well it's, it's fluff, Henry. All I'm saying is, is simply uh, sit down with a with a with a set of sort of empirical measures, and and sort of try to chart out, you know, from from wherever you're talking about 1903, you know, to 2003, where black people would have been, and mind you, not just us. What has always fascinated me about the black professional classes, civil rights activists, Du Bois and legacy is what progressive white historians uh, have always, like Zinn, who has just passed, uh, have always pointed out that every time there's a breakthrough on behalf of getting rid of the authoritarian, racist, oligarchy barriers against black folk, you also spread it around, as it were, first to white women, then to the disabled, then to homosexuals, and all across the marginalized Mulberry Bush of all these authoritarian, all these authoritarian subplots of American civilization. We're a democracy only in the formal sense of that word. Within the democracy, there's always been what I call massive 
authoritarian subplots. And we black folks were, of course, the biggest of those massive authoritarian subplots. Okay. And every time we break a barrier vis-a-vis -vis us, even without our, 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 our leadership having that in mind, although the voice always had others in mind, okay? He never simply challenged the system with the, uh, you know, with the kind of, kind of uh, a single-minded Afro-American outcome. Right. We, we got to let, we got to let, now we have three people in line. Okay, yeah, sorry. Uh, William Joyce Wilson and Reverend Eugene Rivers. Got to be quick. Okay. I'll be quick. Uh, Professor Kilson. The dinner quick. Yeah. I have a bad ear. So. Oh, here. Uh, Professor Kilson, we've had a, many years of this discussion about uh, Booker T, but a question in reframing how we might look at, at his contributions uh, within the context of, of uh, post Reconstruction, the Deep South, uh, the withdrawal of federal support in its entirety, a strategy for survival, and in fact to build an infrastructure uh, 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 of economic viability. Uh, as a way of bridging a period of time, as a way of insulating, in fact, blacks from, from the, uh, the terror that was surrounding them uh, uh, at, that at that time. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Um, yeah, that's a good, yeah. that's an interesting point. Mm -hmm. But it's just hypothetical. <laughs> what he knows doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <It's wrong. laughs> what? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Booker said, leave yeah. it alone. Don't challenge white folks on the assumption, of course, that there was going to be a trade-off. Mm -hmm. And that's what Tuskegee Institute right. was an institution as a trade-off. They never even gave Tuskegee Institute enough money no. to train no. enough of us, let alone the other eight million black folks. Mm -hmm. So it didn't make any sense, <laughs> Lewis. But I have to convince Lewis. <laughs> because it's like trying to convince a nun not to be a nun <laughs> or whatever, but it's fine. He has a right to be. He has a right to be a book right. I have a right to be a yeah, Martin, Martin, well, Martin, I was struck by your. Well, I was, I was struck by your comments uh, you know, when you went back to your, your old neighborhood on Plasky Street. Yeah, it wasn't Street. Like my neighborhood, but the, but yeah. You, yeah, uh, but you yeah. were shocked. It's yeah. the only part of the Philadelphia I knew. Yeah, right, okay. It's this uh, subplot called right. Germantown. And, it's and, still there, by the way, a marvelous place. By and you mentioned, uh, you mentioned the, uh, the out-migration of uh, higher-income uh, uh, blacks, uh, the black middle class. Yeah, they're and straightforward, I, middle yeah, class people, you know, sure. civil servants. And, 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 and also, clerks. and working class blacks, many of them also, yeah. uh, as well as uh, um, industries that, you know, uh, uh, have, have departed. Uh, um, and there are many reasons for that, which I won't go into. But I do want to say that there was one other great factor that you didn't mention. Maybe mm -hmm. you have it in the book. And that is, in addition to the out-migration of, 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 uh, uh, of middle and working class blacks from a lot of these neighborhoods and industries, there is also the secession of the second great migration, which ended around 1970. Mm -hmm. And so as blacks moved out, uh, they were not no longer being replaced or replenished mm -hmm. with uh, black migrants coming in from the South. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that resulted in uh, uh, depopulated areas, abandoned buildings, vacant lots, boarded up buildings, captured in HBO's The Wire. Right. You know, and when you look at, you know, and so, and so what you see is black neighborhoods that have moved from densely packed areas, very, very vibrant areas, mm -hmm. featuring the black communitarian agencies that you talked about, densely packed, some people sharing, families sharing two or more apartments to areas that are now depopulated uh, because of the out-migration and the secession of the great migration from the South. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, marvelous, marvelous, yeah. thank you. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, Julius for that. Uh, Professor Kilson, uh, two points. Uh, a, uh, on this uh, Booker T. Uh, du Bois bifurcation that you insist upon, right, that there's got to be, um, there is a way of understanding it, and, I'm, and this, is, this is a quick question. A, uh, is it not possible to conceptualize the Booker T. Uh, du Bois thing in terms of regional variations of, and, and tactical responses as opposed to bad faith? I mean, it's, I, one can conceive of uh, 
in the, in the context of the apartheid South, someone making morally unattractive uh, trade-offs because there are no viable options. I don't have to be an opportunist just not to have my house burnt down <laughs> because Webb Du Bois decided to stay out of the South and talk stuff from New England. <laughs> you see, it's easy to talk stuff and, 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 and to be and, and to take the kind of ideological position that Du Bois took when he stayed safely in the North talking stuff. But he did go to Atlanta. And he did come to Atlanta. No, but, but my point is that, and, and unlike, but, but unlike Du Bois, uh, Washington tries to build an institution. Right. And see, the politics, it's, it's like the difference between being a, a prophet and a pastor. Mm -hmm. A pastor, by definition, is, has to govern and build an institution, right. which requires a different set of leadership skills mm -hmm. than being a prophet who talks stuff, ain't got a following, you know, <laughs> you know, is not, not responsible for anybody. Just as, this is a biblical thing, right? Isaiah and Amos can talk stuff because they got to build nothing, and they ain't got no families to take care of, right? So, 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 so I want to push that point. And then secondly, uh, this question, is the, what is the functional operational difference between your conception of black communitarianism and what the, the we Neolithic Negroes used to call black nationalism 30 years ago? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Professor well, well, Rivers' formulation is, is of course, an, an old, long-standing kind of establishmentarian formulation <laughs> as between Du Bois. Well, it is as between Du Bois and Booker T. Washington. Du Bois simply went where, went to that section of the American cultural territory where you could lead a progressive discourse on behalf of black freedom. That's all. He's right. Well, well, he's right, and I don't know. It. But I mean, I don't know. It. I mean, my, my point is, I don't know what follows from that kind of discourse. It's not much different from what my former very successful financial managing student, Lewis Jones, believes. It's just a more fancified variant of it. Du Bois is the cutting edge of black people's freedom. This is, let me put it in a very straightforward light. So the issue is, do you want to be the cutting edge of black people's freedom, or do you want to be the cutting, not build an institution, Tuskegee is not the only institution. There were institutions in the North, all over the bloody place. There was Wilberforce, there was Cheney State, there was Lincoln University, there was Morgan State, there was the federal government supporting. It's not, a, a, not simply an either or situation. These are generic differences, and you have to stand on one side of that leadership divide, one side of the two methodologies, or you stand on the other. Now, Rivers' position is a kind of straddling. That is, I, no, I, well, I don't know. Well, you did it. You did it. You did it, Larry. You did it, Larry. He was in Harvard College, so he took one of my courses. But he did it. He did it, Larry. He did it. Martin, uh, can you envision, given where we are in terms of race relations today, right. can you envision uh, a <laughs> communitarian, communitarian mm -hmm. which I hear, in which I hear communist and humanitarian, <laughs> right. sure. a communitarian <laughs> movement sure. that would address the issues of the underclass oh, and yeah. change oh, yeah. the oh, yeah. underclass? Oh, oh, yeah. I can envisage it, uh, you know, and there are lots of subplots going on as you, you know, you know, like Canada in, uh, in uh, New York City. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, it's going on all over the lots of, and I've tried to get a couple of former students to start looking at it. I don't know why, you know, young black academics or young white academics who have liberal interest in the conditions of the week. And blacks happen to be a big part of the conditions of the American week. It's going on. You know, and what's needed now is something nationally to coagulate, you know, and to give a national platform, and therefore ultimately give it national public policy capability, because ultimately it can be successful in, in reversing, you know, the terrible life cycle of the weak working class and below, which I would say maybe it's near 35 to 40 percent of African American households, it's a large part of us still. And uh, yes, 
I envisage it, uh, uh, Florence Ladd, uh, partly because it's going on. There are people doing it. You know, the white and black kids who do the KIPP schools. I mean, there's so many subplots of it all around us. And uh, what you need is to have it coagulated. Ergo, I talk in terms of this coagulating language, black civil society revitalization movement. This is a quick way of the. But the uh, problem is, Mike, that we have the percentage built correctly, but if I remember correctly, they got the thing was killed. Percentage of black children living out of the poverty line was about 38%. Does that sound reasonable? About right? And it's 35% now, right? So there's a steady stateness about it. Steady stateness. And, no, but the black middle class has either quadrupled or doubled, whatever index oh, yeah. you, you know. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. We, yeah. And we, so we, we, we have this. We've tried quadrupled almost. Yeah. So we have these parallel classes replicating each yeah. other, as you said so well. Yeah. And like parallel lines, yeah. they never will meet. Yeah. Yeah. They're just self perpetual. Yeah. We could yeah. be remembered as a generation that presided over the permanent class divide within the African American. Yeah, yeah. But yeah and the, I we don't could want be. to remember as that, and you don't want to be no. remembered as that, and my children. You know, who all in their forties don't want to be remembered as that, and I know my grandchildren, three of whom were here yesterday. The oldest is, uh, is um, my wife knows the age is, is probably <laughs> seventeen. <laughs> he's a seventeen, or he'll be he'll be eighteen. They don't want to be remembered as that. No, right. And I know that Du Bois doesn't want to no. be remembered. But nobody knows uh, what to do about what, it. Well, Linda Haywood. I, I think this is where we know, Hayward. we know, and we don't know. You know yeah. what I mean? Henry, we know and we don't know. We know how to solve this problem. And I think it's essentially a question of, uh, of mental will, intellectual will. We have the resources. We're the wealthiest body country in the world. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, 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 yeah. I'm here at Cornell West and Tavis Yeah. 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 Sure. Oh, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I agree, Charles. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I agree. Oh, I agree. that here we have Skip at the helm of the Du Bois yes, Institute. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if, in fact, some of the things that Skip is doing, especially in terms of bringing certain type of knowledge to the public, if that is one way that mobilization can be done, African-American lives, trying to, in fact, instill, you know, using that medium as a way of, you know, we, we no longer could use going to, you know, the black, YMCA, but we certainly can use the web, the internet, oh, yeah. in a way to bring that type of, uh, you know, politics, identity plus, you know, reconstruction to the masses. And I wondered what you thought about that and what you will tell Skip. Well, no, I, 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 I won't tell him anything. He knows more about it than I do. Uh, no, I agree fully with you. It's a nice formulation. And uh, the media uh, agencies in the hands of liberal and progressive black persons are there. Yeah. I mean, Radio One, I mean, yeah. they're there. You're talking about Smiley, Smiley Show. Millions of people watch the thing every evening. So uh, the mechanisms are in place. Someone asked that question. Yeah, the mechanisms are in place. We're now talking about will. Will and uh, a leadership, intellectual, powerful, coagulating f personality, you know? <laughs> That's what now we need. We need so, you know, of course, King was the master of that kind of Co coagulating mm -hmm. progressive liberal personality. That person's there too. They're out there. Someone's out there. I know that. I feel it every day, you know. All this stuff is very intuitive. Mm -hmm. You know, and you have to let your intuitiveness side of your mindset run wild. I always let mine run yeah. wild. So I agree fully with you. Good. Tell me something. So I'm um, I was wondering about the way you responded to, to Skip's initial formulation because it seemed like the, the, the thrust of your presentation of Du Bois's view suggested a different way of responding to it, which was to, to reject the, that, that particular way of, of, of framing the question as um, which strategy would work best. 
because um, which strategy would best bring about um, racial progress, whereas you were emphasizing um, a, a sort of Du Boisian point that has to do with not just what strategy would likely bring about the, the racial progress at the fastest rate, but about what are permissible um, means for bringing about that strategy. Um, and among the things that, I mean, Du Bois was uh, thought was he, he, he didn't think you could use, for instance, demagoguery, even if it might bring things about, because he, the emphasis on, on truth and not manipulating people. He also didn't think that it was appropriate to do things by word or deed that suggested that blacks were inferior and weren't due uh, um, equal rights and didn't have equal standing. So part of the objection to Booker T. Washington is not just that um, certain strategies won't work, though he made that kind of pragmatic argument as well, but a principled argument about what means can a people use where they can maintain their self-respect uh, even if it turns out that it will slow their progress over, over time. And that seemed to be the thrust of your comments, but that's not the way you responded to Skip. No, that's right. That, that's not the way I, I responded. I think it's right. I mean, there's a kind of a multi-layered set of possibilities at any given time. So what's important, of course, is that given time, the time span, uh, I, would, I would suggest, in which these two leadership paradigms realized themselves was conducive, you know, was conducive to one and not conducive to the other. Uh, and it, was, it would have been conducive to Booker T. Washington's if, if he had, you know, convinced a majority of the black professional sector and its intelligentsia. Uh, it would have been very conducive to him and I don't know what the consequences I mean, that's the query, isn't it, Henry is saying? Had the uh, 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 mainstream system been more conducive to uh, the, uh, the uh, Booker T. Washington paradigm, which means it would have had to contribute more on the trade-off side to him, would have, would have, I don't know, tripled, quadrupled the budgets of Negro colleges. I mean, that's what the Booker T. Washington uh, if uh, Professor Shelby understands this, that's what it was about. It wasn't just another, you know, kind of mental mindset, a kind of hypothetical mindset option available, put out there for, uh, you know, for white America to decide among. You know, it, it had a certain set of uh, prescriptions, uh, which had a set, certain set of obligations for white America if Booker T. Washington's arrangements hadn't survived. And mind you, I think there's a lot of serendipity in the outcome. Booker T. Washington will die prematurely, in a certain sense almost accidentally, from an unexpected heart attack, which is associated with trauma, personal trauma, associated with certain kinds of pathologies in his life. He was running around with other people's wives. The wives of wealthy people who funded him. And one caught him coming out of his bloody Park Street house three in the morning and beat the Negro like you beat a slave. Do you guys know how Booker T. Washington died? He died because he was ill. Now, assume Washington had survived Shelley uh, and uh, these young neophytes, you know, this great woman I'm slowly discovering, Anna Julia Cooper. Uh, and, uh, and Archibald Grimke and his brother, these others, they would have had a hell of a time putting into the marketplace of political ideas and options for black people challenging Booker T. Washington. Not many white newspapers would have been available to them. Uh, nothing about the white middle and power class platforms would have been available to them. And Booker T. Washington just might have prevailed. But I don't believe in all this philosophical ifs and but proposition that you're putting up on me. That's all, that's all. That's, that's, well, it just doesn't get to the issue. That's why I'm a political studies scholar and not a philosophy of society scholar like <laughs> Professor Shelby. <laughs> <laughs> One more question from our superstar undergraduate, Sun Bodelli. Can you ask your question more clearly? Stand up. Thanks a lot, Professor Kelson. It's a honor to uh, hear you talk. Thank um, you. I'm pretty sure I'm the youngest person in this room. And, 
And uh, I'm a senior now in the department, and every year we always have the debate about what my generation is going to do to give back, and we always have debates about should we do TFA and go into black communities and teach, or do we need, do we need more black lawyers and black bankers, and should we make money and give back to the black community? And I'd just like to hear your perspective on well, the what last you think. one is really one of the things I've always suggested. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have always. Lewis Jones, that's why I love him. Become another Lewis Jones. You know, learn economics, learn business capitalist skills, and make a lot of money. And then you can do so many things. You like know? give it to the Du Bois Institute. I, I mean, <laughs> well, not, not quite The Booker T. Washington Institute. I'm, I'm in. Not quite that. <laughs> Not quite that. We don't need the money, but look at all these helping hand groups that are out there now, like KIPP. Mm. You know, Kip's hell, great. if I were making eight, ten million dollars a year, I think I would give a million a year away. I don't know. You ever think about that kind of thing? Professors like us, we always had this assumption that if we had X and Y and Z million, you know, we would do this or that, but then when you get it, it has a logic of its own. I hope it does, it does. I know someone like that, so that's why I say this. And, uh, he doesn't give very much away. He only gives any more away than my wife and I give annually of our income. You know, we're just upper middle class people. We're not wealthy, but we survive. And uh, so, no, there's no other words. What I'm saying, young man, is that there's no blueprint. You know, there are many ways, many flowers bloom. I guess that's the way. And I've always believed that as a leftist. So this very day, there's so many ways to do decent things for human beings and decent things for black folks. I can't think of so a that's more. That's the way to think about it. I can't think of a more fitting way to end. Let's give it up for <laughs> Professor Martin Kilson. And see you tomorrow in this room. <laughs>